What's going on, everybody? I guess I should pull my mic close to my face. That would probably help for the uh, for the AMA. What's up, guys? It's Joe Troyer. How are you guys doing today? Welcome, welcome officially to the Wednesday AMA. Lots and lots and lots of familiar names and faces. Man, it seems like, it just seems crazy. Like the same people, I feel like, um, plus or minus 10%, like join us each and every week. And I know you guys are getting a ton of value. So I'm glad, right? That's why we do this shit. That's why I'm here each and every week. So welcome, welcome officially everybody to the call. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, squirrel. <laughs> so real quick, how many of you guys got the go-to uh, go to meeting notification reminder email like just a minute ago um, and you saw squirrel in the title? I know Scott Lindsay did, right? He, he quite literally typed in the chat immediately, squirrel. If you got that, let me know. Is Scott the only one? Is Scott the only one? Usman says he did. Usman, you cheater. You knew I was sending it out. Nobody else saw Squirrel. All right. So um, when I talk about entrepreneurs' ADD tendencies, right, uh, and how easily we're distracted, huh, I often um, like have a flashback type of moment to this. How many of you guys can see this on the screen? I know it's probably hard to see. There we go. That's a little better. Squirrel. Dennis says yes. This is exactly what pops into my head. And so if you've been on a webinar and you've heard me talk about focus and priorities and you know uh, some of the not so great traits uh, of being an entrepreneur, uh, you've heard me say squirrel. And I've never probably shared, I don't think I have, like where this takes me in my mind, right? And it takes me right freaking here, right? It takes me to um, to National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation and Chevy Chase and the squirrel running around the tree, and then you know the 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 dad or the father-in-law burning down the the Christmas tree because of you know because he was smoking a stogie inside the house, like just vivid flashback, and it like internally makes me laugh every single time I see it. How many of you guys are familiar with this uh, with this movie, by the way? Curious. So uh, at my household, this is like a this is a family tradition. Um, Christmas vacation is and uh, not just a family tradition like during Christmas time or the holidays. Like it's a it's a freaking classic and it's a tradition year round. Like it comes on TV. It's getting recorded and we're watching it, um, even though like I think we have it on every platform that you could possibly buy it on. Like this is watched probably once a month, no joke. So uh, absolutely one of my favorite uh, favorite shows. Yeah, Frankie, Scott, Dennis, John, Douglas. Yeah, yeah, man, crazy. All right, good stuff. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping, kind of catch up, uh, hang out while we wait for everybody to join and get their seat and close their office doors and you know shut down all their other distractions. Uh, last week, last week um, I was out. For most of the week, uh, I was in uh, Orlando. My family and I bought uh, season passes to all of the Universal parks. Uh, and they're, uh, so you got Universal, you got Islands of Adventure, and then you have their water park. Uh, and the water park was great. Islands of Adventure were great. Um, the, the whole experience was absolutely, absolutely fantastic. And then end of the week, like it was right back into the swing of things. And this week has been nuts too. Um, how many of you guys have seen, I'm curious, um, give me one if you've seen that, that I released the podcast. Did you guys see that? Not an episode, like we created a brand new podcast. You guys see that? You guys catch that yet? So you guys, um, I'm sure are well aware that I am a little obsessed and a little OCD about um, over delivering on my uh, over delivering or, or earning my tagline that I've been using in my email, which is Joe over deliver Troyer. So in terms of my content marketing and the content that you guys are getting, obviously doing these weekly webinars and, and that's becoming content for the week on YouTube and people seem to, to really be loving these live webinars and also the YouTube channel, but kind of secretly, not secretly, like we told you guys, but we haven't made a big deal about it. We eked out, the team eked out, geeked out, launched um, a brand new podcast called uh, Show Me the Nuggets. Um, and 
the I, I want to share with you guys the perspective here. Um, so the the title is Show Me the Nuggets. Obviously, you guys know me. Like I'm trying to give you guys more value. Um, I'm trying not to just be another podcast though. Like there's a couple good podcasts that I listen to and the rest of them, like to be honest folks, um, I'm subscribed to and I'm just constantly like, nah, 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 like that sounds boring. Like this is just like every other, you know, um, podcast out there. And so that's not what I wanna be, right? Like you guys know me um, well enough, isn't good enough for, for me and for digital triggers and for everything that we do here. So um, the, the, the position that I'm taking with the podcast and the angle and, and what it means to you ultimately is that we're really focused on bringing on entrepreneurs that are really, really, really good at something. Like they are breakout in a category, in a tactic, right, in their business, right? And their business has flourished because of that tactic, that process, that system, okay? And then we're simply asking them, right, at the end of the day, like, to show us the nuggets, right? Show me the nuggets. And people laugh at the name, show me the nuggets. Um, and, and it's funny, like, everybody looks at the name and they start laughing. Uh, so it's got some, some, some uh, comedic comedy. How do you, how do you, I don't know, how would you say that? Comedy appeal, so to speak, it makes people laugh. But ultimately, at the end of the day, like, my goal is to have people that are really smart doing something come on and share their takeaways with you to share their systems to share their processes and to do our best to really break things into a system for you guys that once you're done listening or going through the the interview that you guys can take something along with you right so tim solo for example like we really in this in this first episode here we really focused on on how to create linkable assets and how blogging is not really blogging anymore. And if you're using the old traditional like blogging model uh, for link building, you're gonna get crushed. Um, and he talked about how they're running their link building process, Tim Solo at Ahrefs. So Ahrefs.com, which is obviously the notorious you know, link building, link audit software that's a competitor to, to Moz and Majestic. And to be frank, like, I think that they've absolutely crushed Moz and Majestic in my point of view, in terms of the value that they're adding to the marketplace and their tool. Um, and then the second one, we had a uh, fellow South Floridian, um, Ryan Stewart come on the call. And Ryan really broke down. So Ryan, much like me, built an agency pretty quickly actually, and then exited, and it was an SEO agency. And so we had kind of a, a fun chat about our takeaways and our aha moments after selling companies. Um, so there's some really good content in there about that and like what we're both focused on now and why, which I think is really, really good perspective for everybody. Um, but then second, like we really went into detail about Ryan's uh, five-step SEO process. And again, the goal is like to give you guys that process so that you guys can grab it, you guys can rip it off and you guys can implement it really easily. Uh, and then the third one we had with uh, Matt Diggity, who is another infamous SEO. And if you guys can tell, there's a theme here in, in the first three episodes. They're all hardcore SEO people. So Matt Diggity came on and we really took the perspective of an affiliate SEO. And how do you build a site to generate five figures a month with affiliate SEO um, without having to have any clients? And then we really went deep on how do you then sell that site? Okay, so Matt's been selling these sites and getting crazy multiples, like 34 times multiples uh, on these affiliate sites. And we talked about who the different types of buyers are and what revenue types do you sell to these different types of buyers and what's that life cycle look like and um, who can you get to do these sales for you? And we really broke down, okay, how you guys can build a five figure a month affiliate SEO site and then how you can ultimately exit for a huge multiple as well. Um, these, these affiliate sites are definitely in, uh, in demand in the marketplace. So does that sound cool or what? Give me, give me uh, some feedback in the chat, a number, a letter, I don't care. G give me something, does that sound good? Yeah, awesome, 11, very cool, yes. Um, so this morning, um, I was up bright and early, I was up at 4 a.m. this morning and um, 
and we had a uh, another interview which you guys will see coming uh, here shortly uh, for the podcast. Uh, and then today, what else did we have? Today, I had a um, a call with all the Agency Growth Vortex members um, with with myself and Rob Warner for all the pro members, and we're running those calls once a week. So some of you guys, I know, I saw you on that call today. What's up? It's good to see you again. Uh, I feel like we're family, like like quite literally spending all this time together. Um, so with the podcast, um, I, I could really use a favor. Okay, I could really, 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 really use a favor. See, when you launch a podcast, um, the first 60 days is really crucial for iTunes specifically. And it's really crucial to get the opportunity to show up in new and noteworthy inside of iTunes. And, and what that does, showing up inside of new and noteworthy, like people go to new and noteworthy, what is all the new, you know, podcasts that, that are really popular. And, you know, then they click on their category. So like, what are all the new business podcasts that are really popular? And by, um, by really getting your customers, your prospects of the uh, podcast to subscribe and to review and to download the episodes and to listen to the episodes, um, they use those as their ranking factors, so to speak, just like in SEO. Okay, so guys, I could really, really use a favor in first off, just opening up iTunes, right? If uh, as long as you use iTunes or have an Apple ID, right? If you're on your phone, go to the podcast app is the easiest place. And then do a search for show me the nuggets. If you're on your desktop computer um, or your laptop computer and you have iTunes installed, you can just do a search for show me the nuggets. You'll see me here in my ugly mug front and center. And then you're just gonna hit subscribe. And then you will be able to hit subscribe and then go over to ratings and review and write me a review. Okay, and guys, I don't want you to lie. Please do me a favor, like don't lie here. If you haven't listened to the episode like or the podcast yet, don't don't lie and say, this is the most amazing episode ever, the most amazing podcast ever. Um, if, if you wanna fast track the review for my benefit, I really appreciate that. Um, what I would say though is just say something about me, right? Give me a review, not so much the podcast a review, just so that it's truthful. Okay, and guys, I would I would really, really, really appreciate that. Um, it looks like Usman actually put in a link directly to iTunes here. I'll put that in the chat for everybody. So if you guys could do that for me, if you guys can make the commitment to do that for me, that would be amazing. I'd really appreciate it. Um, if that's cool with you guys, you can make that commitment for me. You do me that favor. Just give me a nine in the chat. That'd be fantastic. I would really, really, really appreciate it. Um, gives me a chance to spread the message, right, and, and get some traction on the podcast during this first crucial, you know, 30, 60 days as as we launch, okay? Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you, Frankie. Uh, thank you, Scott. Really appreciate it. Scott says he already done it. Yeah, he's on the screen right here. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate that, brother. You're an awesome guy. Uh, John, thank you, brother. And, and for everybody else typing in right now, John, uh, John G and John W, thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. So, the other thing um, before we kind of move on um, is we're running a contest. So um, I got to talk about this little app too, but we're running a podcast or we're running a contest with the podcast. So if you go to digitaltriggers.io slash contest, um, we're also doing something really cool for you guys with everybody that, that comes on. Okay. So um, the first three categories that we're talking about, um, or the first uh, category that we're talking about with all first three guests is SEO, okay? So quite literally, we got Matt Diggity, right? Ryan Stewart and Tim Solo from Ahrefs, right? To all put in, to all put in these crazy prizes, right? So one ticket to the Chiang Mai SEO conference, right? I know some of you guys go to this every year, the last couple of years that they put it on, right? One free access to Ahrefs blogging for business course, which they sell for 800 bucks. And then Ryan Stewart sells the blueprint training for three grand, right? And so you guys, uh, one person, one lucky person will, will win the, uh, the blueprint, blueprint training. So like crazy over delivery in every way in terms of content, like they really let me pick their brains 
And if that wasn't enough, I was like, oh yeah, and I want you guys to like give your best shit away for free. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and they said, yes, right? So everybody has a chance to win these things, okay? But the best part is, is that even if you don't end up winning any of the big three prizes, you automatically, guys, after the contest is over, are going to get access to these other prizes, okay? Each and every person is, just for entering. Okay, so these are all things that, you know, the, the guests are charging for that they're allowing me to give away to my crew, aka you guys, right? And you guys don't have to pay for it. Is that cool shit or what? Good stuff? I, I'm working for that name, right? I'm working for that Joe over Deliver Troyer all day, every guys, all day, every day. I'm putting in the effort. All right, good stuff. All right, so that takes care of the podcast. And again, it's digitaltriggers.io slash contest. I put that link in the chat. We talked about last week, I was at Disney. Um, we talked about the podcast, subscribe and review. We talked about Squirrel. Um, let's see, so, um, and again, we will have the normal AMA today, just trying to catch you guys up on some stuff. So let's get rid of that. Um, how many of you guys use um, this uh, extension from, uh, from Google Chrome? So this is called Momentum. How many of you guys use Momentum? Let me know in the chat. Scott Lindsay, like Scott Lindsay says, hells yeah. So Scott, you were always like on the bleeding edge in terms of tech, man. You got to keep sharing with me like what you're using. Uh, I, I'm sure I'll pick up a thing or two. So um, I, I absolutely love momentum. I saw somebody using it and was like, oh, that's a really nice background. And uh, that looks really nice. Like that's visually appealing. And so that's why I got it. And I installed it and set it up probably Monday. And I can't tell you guys, like every time I come to my computer, like I look at the background and I'm just like in awe, right? Like I look at the screen and it's just so visually appealing. Like it gets me into like creative mode and it gets me like accepting that I'm about to bust out a shitload of work. Um, so it's just, it's been like super refreshing for me. So essentially there's all kinds of integrations like so you get the nice cool image and this changes out every day. And then at the bottom you get a quote and this quote changes out every day as well. And so that's cool. I'm not really using what's your main focus today. I like the little time here, but I've kind of minimized everything else. Like they have, they have a lot more integrations, but I'm afraid to like overpower this thing, so to speak. Not because it couldn't handle it, but it's just so visually appealing to me. Like. It has a to-do list integration if you upgrade to their pro. And like, that's really interesting to me. And it integrates with this app that I use called Wonderlist. Um, but, but I'm scared to do it because I don't want to ruin like my, my, uh, my amazing experience that I have every day looking at this thing. So uh, I'm kind of crossing my fingers like this is going to keep lasting, but this has been an amazing app. Super, super simple. Uh, but I can't believe like how much of a difference it's made. Like when I turn on my computer and look at it, like every day, like I'm in awe, like super, super um, basic app, but honestly has like wowed me. Um, and that's, that's definitely not normal. All right, good stuff. So we covered momentum too. Um, and for those of you guys that are, uh, that are following some of my health stuff, one little last tidbit before we jump into today's presentation. Um, I just ended my fast. So I just broke my fast. I broke it with some bone broth. Um, definitely one of the ways that I've been breaking my fast uh, most recently and a lot with bone broth. Um, and uh, right now I am drinking some exogenous ketones from this company called uh, Perfect Keto. So those of you guys following the keto journey, following you know my my health journey, I see a lot of you guys responding and commenting and replying into chat. That's what I'm up to right now. So without further ado, we're going to kick off the AMA officially. Welcome everybody to the call. We got a lot of really really good questions to cover this week, and uh, and we're going to go ahead and jump right in. So Teresa asks. Would you use GMB Insights over a paid service such as Bright Local? And um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna keep it out of full screen view just so I can type in here with you guys on the call. So um, would you use GMB Insights over a paid service such as Bright Local? And the big resilient answer 
is a fuck no. Yes, Joe just swore big time. At the end of the day, folks, I need you guys to understand that that when it comes to keyword data, when it comes to um, when it comes to running your business and and keeping track of your KPIs, you should not be leaning on Google exclusively to keep track of your most important KPIs, especially historically when it comes to you know keyword search volume on a local level. When it comes to Google, my business insights are freaking trash. They're not accurate even remotely, okay? So I wanna give you guys a, a real life example of this so that you guys can, can make sure that this sinks in, okay? But I need you first and foremost, just to take away that you should never be relying on GMB insights, okay? So practical, real use case, okay? Um, there is a keyword phrase, one keyword phrase, that according to Google's keyword tool, in one city and one location, that keyword phrase um, had a search volume of 50 searches a month, okay? When we rank for that keyword and that keyword shows up and it's ranking inside of Google Maps and it's like the only keyword phrase that it's ranking for, and the, the reason for that is because it was like a, like a really close to exact match domain or keyword phrase. So if the keyword phrase is ABC Dental, the domain, for example, is like abcdental.com, okay? So like it was ranking for that like quickly, but wasn't ranking for anything else, okay? So the search volume on ABC Dental in this example, right, is 50 searches a month, okay? We rank for it, right? We rank for it, we rank for it using a GMB, we rank in the three pack. Um, I think when we did this test, we were ranking number two in the three pack. So we weren't number one, we had like no freaking reviews yet. Um, the, the number one competitor had like the five star snippet showing up and let's call it that they had 40 reviews, right? So they're like the dominant person there in the three pack. So being below them with no reviews, like we're not gonna get a whole lot of traffic, right? So keyword volume is 50, we're ranking number two, but we like have no presence almost because we're just getting like shadowed by the, the top competitors in the three pack. So we, we rank and, um, and I look inside of Google My Business Insights and this is like months into us ranking. And I look at it and it's saying that we're getting roughly 50 phone calls per month. Okay, that is what they're reporting. Anybody want to have a guess when we looked at call tracking, how many calls we were actually receiving on a monthly basis? Frankie says 100. What's up, Frankie Allen? Good guess. Dennis says 100. Folks, over 200 phone calls a month. And when I look at those 200 phone calls, just to be clear, those were like 200 raw, or I'm sorry, those were 200 unique phone calls, meaning anybody that called back multiple times was already filtered out of that number. Okay, so like gross, I'm sure it was more like 250 or 260. So yes, I swore, yes, I got explicit, but at the end of the day, folks, like you, you cannot put all of your eggs in one basket and, and Google, uh, Google Maps and, and Google Keyword Tool and Google uh, Keyword Volume on a local level, like I need you guys to understand, like fundamentally has been screwed for a really, really long time. And you should not be counting on that data or you're missing the boat completely. Frankie Allen says, oh my gosh, I need to set up call tracking. Yes, 100% you got to set up call tracking, right? So let's talk about that now. So how do you do a good job of truly capturing that data? Okay, so the way that you do a good job is inside of Google My Business, and I'm not gonna pull it up here. I can walk you guys through it step by step. Just know that it's not on the screen, right? So inside of Google My Business, there is a place where you can edit your phone number. Okay, what I want you to do is I want you to go and I want you to add another phone number 
and I want you to swap out the primary phone number and the additional phone number. Okay. And what's going to happen is the phone number that's showing inside of Google My Business and that people would click on to call is really your phone number, your tracking phone number. And so it'll replace the phone number that they use everywhere, like Yelp and before in the GMB and Yellow Pages. But that phone number is still going to be tied to that account and to that listing. And so Google knows right to keep it associated with your account so if you've already got a site that's got citations and everything else and you're not starting from scratch this is how you use call tracking without having to update all those freaking citations and deal with the tracking mess okay good stuff all right fantastic so guys 100 percent of the time okay uh, just just err on the side of caution and that 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 Google my business insights is going to be wrong right their data is going to be wrong the keyword tool is going to be wrong uh, just make that assumption please moving forward okay so then should you use a paid service such as bright local then is kind of the second part of the question and so I would use hundred percent call tracking number one but then number two and that's like required like I don't do anything without call tracking and then number two like bright local is good because Bright Local will understand Bright Local pulls in some data from like Google My Business Insights though. So I wouldn't be looking at Bright Local to provide me with the, the data inside their interface from GMB Insights, like that's retarded. We just said that that data wasn't very good, right? But what I would do is use GMB Insights to help me audit my Google My Business account and tell me what I should be doing that I haven't done already. Right, so show me the issue, show me the opportunity, show me what to fix, okay, is, is the first use case for Bright Local. The second use case for Bright Local, okay, is, is like the citation audits in general, and then all the other tracking tools third that are inside of Bright Local. So Bright Local is who I use to this day to do local Google My Business rank tracking. Okay, so um, there are other platforms out there that frankly, like just being honest, I think do a little bit better than Bright Local in terms of the rank tracking piece, um, but they're just like shiny object things and things that for me, I don't think really matter, right? So uh, Bright Local kind of gives me the, the whole suite in one, so to speak, and, and so that's why I love Bright Local. Okay, and they're always updating the tool. They're in the trenches. They have a really good pulse of what's happening in the local market. All right, so question number two is, what's the best way to calculate ROI for Google local search? And to be frank, like this is really a continuation of the, the last question, right? And the last question was, would you use GMB Insights over a paid service such as Bright Local? And the resounding answer was like, you know, hell no, but I dropped the F-bomb, right? Like you gotta track everything. So what's the best way to calculate ROI for Google Local Search? So first and foremost is, is you gotta make sure that you're using call tracking. So use call tracking in your Google My Business listing. And that's going to help you guys um, understand the call volume that's coming from Google My Business. But then you still got Google Organic. And so what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna run a tracking number, specifically when a referral comes to your site from Google, you're gonna wanna show them a tracking number just for Google Local, right? Or Google Organic, okay? So that's secondary. And then third, if you're running any type of pay-per-click advertising, right? You want to have a third tracking medium or a way to track, right? The, 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 the calls that are coming in from pay-per-click, okay? For example, through Google ads, okay? Which used to be Google AdWords. So there's two different ways, just so you guys know, and so we get the elephant out of the room. There's two different ways that you can run call tracking specifically for Google PPC. So you could just have a phone number, right? One phone number for, for Google Ads, for Google PPC, that all the calls get forwarded to, and then you're just tracking it that way, okay? If you're doing that and you're spending any real amount of money on Google pay-per-click advertising, I gotta tell you that you're missing the boat. Like, you're missing it 
completely. The, the crazy thing about Google PPC advertising and Google paid advertising with Google ads and an effective call tracking setup and the proper call tracking setup is you're gonna be able to dial down right, your conversions and your tracking to what campaign, what ad and what keyword phrase ultimately brought you the call. That type of granular detail for tracking calls, right, doesn't really exist anywhere but Google pay-per-click. Right, like can you track Facebook ads if you put a tracking phone number in it? Yes, but you're not gonna be able to track which audience, which landing page, which ad brought that. Does that make sense? So at the end of the day, if you're if you're spending money on Google pay-per-click, you better, right? You better be using all the tracking that you can so you can figure out what's working and what's not. Right, there's a famous quote by the godfather of marketing and advertising that says, if that, that basically states like, uh, he would be a very wealthy man if he only knew which part of his marketing was working. Right, there's no way to get a more granular level than, than Google pay-per-click and Google ads, uh, specifically using call tracking and, and making use of a pool of phone numbers. So that's kind of like the little keyword phrase you gotta know. Um, or you could say, do you do um, keyword level call tracking with Google Ads? Okay, and now actually they're rolling out the, the same thing. Most of the major players out there are rolling out the same thing for Bing. Okay, so let's let's step through this one by one, all right? So definitely if, if you're doing Google Maps, we'll just say GMB for Google My Business. Uh, we're gonna do a dedicated phone number. Uh, we're gonna say a dedicated, instead of phone number, call tracking number. So then we're also going to track Google organic, um, dedicated refer tracking. And, and this is just, let's say call tracking number. And basically guys, the way that this one works, is this is just looking at did the visitor come from Google Organic? Okay, that's it. There's no keyword level here, right? Then, um, if you're tracking Google or if you're tracking, if you're doing, if you're using like Bing for example, you would want to use call tracking for Bing. Um, most people, I, I don't even think it's probably worth tracking Bing Organic, but if you're doing Bing Paid, you're spending money on the clicks. Um, I, I would suggest using call tracking for that. And again, all the big major players have rolled out, again, what they call like the, the keyword level call tracking. And again, that is just like that, that super, super granule level call tracking that you can't, that, that like you can't really get anywhere else besides Bing um, and, and Google pay-per-click. So let's say Bing PPC and let's say Google uh, ads, PPC. And again, here we would do the same thing. Okay, so this is, this is all guys assuming though that, uh, that we wanna track phone calls. And for local businesses at the end of the day, there's probably a 99% chance that their primary way of doing business is going to be via the phone. So this is gonna make sense for like all of them. Um, and we should set this up. Um, the other thing though that we should set up is, is web form tracking, right? So just a, a conversion web form. So we all have them on our website, even if we try not to advertise them or show them because they don't work as well as a phone number and our clients don't do as well following up with them and you know all those reasons, right? But you should definitely have web form tracking done. Right, and your web form tracking should be set up so that you can see your conversions for web forms inside of Google Ads, right? That you can see the tracking inside of uh, Bing, that you can see the tracking in, you know, for Google uh, Organic, and this would happen inside of, um, this would happen inside of Google Analytics. 
So this is the best way, and it's not a perfect way, folks. Far from perfect, but this is the best way to, to really make sure that you're tracking everything so that you have the best data set possible so that you can calculate an ROI for Google local search, okay? All right, so next up, next up, we're talking about paper call. So with paper call, what makes a call billable? So at the end of the day, folks, I want you to know that this is my opinion on how I would approach the market. This is not like uh, a set in stone thing, okay? L let me explain. So traditionally, traditionally, if I can spell, Actually, let's do this instead. Paper call networks. The way that they bill versus going to uh, direct to local business. Let's talk about this so that you guys understand the difference. Paper call networks are going to, um, they're going to pay you out based upon duration. So they're gonna say like duration is greater than 90 seconds. And probably what they aren't going to tell you Let's do this. Duration is greater than 90 seconds. And what they probably aren't going to tell you is that they're treating what they call, this is their language. I, I don't like their language. They're treating the calls. And, and what they mean by that is that they're pushing the caller through at minimum one IVR. And so an IVR is like, hey, press one for residential, or press two for commercial. Okay, press three for this type of roof, press four for that type of roof, for any other type of roof, please press five. Do you guys like when you are on a phone call and they're treating the calls? Give me some feedback in the chat. How many of you guys get really freaking annoyed and how many of you guys just hang up the freaking phone, right? You're like, oh my gosh, they've asked me five questions. Can I just talk to somebody? Understand, yeah. Understand that you guys aren't alone, right? Like that's normal behavior. In fact, um, with every treatment of a call, with every IVR key press, okay, you're going to lose statistically about 20% of your callers. This is a big deal. This is a really, really big deal. Okay, and statistically, you're gonna lose this, okay, on each and every one of the treatments that you offer. So if you're doing paper call, I just gotta be honest, like you don't want these treatments. You want it to ring direct to somebody that can answer the phone. Okay, this also goes for like, you know, um, you, know you call and um, somebody picks up the phone and it's like, you know, to help serve you so you better help, you know, direct you to the, the best representative, please enter your zip code. Same thing, right? It's an IVR, it's a key press, it's that prompt, right? And so paper call networks, like this is gonna be, these are gonna be their main two criteria. And then their third criteria is that it's from a billable or in-network zip code. And that simply means that like wherever it is that your caller is calling from and wants help from or their house is from is for a zip code that they've sold and that they can service. <laughs> yeah, Douglas says between IVR having a long message about hours of operation and location and everything else before I talk to a person, I really hate it. Yeah. So just understand that's how it works with people, you know, the, the leads that you're generating as well. So this is what makes a paper call network offer billable, so to speak, right? Let's not say billable, let's just say in-network zip code. Okay, so then when we're working with a local business, okay, and we're selling direct, instead of going to one of these paper call networks, and let's say that the price on a qualified call here is 12 bucks, over here I can get, no joke, like 90 bucks, right? Like that's the reason why we go direct and why we go sell a local business is because we will literally make six, seven, eight, 10, even 15 times the income. 
if we sell the deal correctly. Okay, now I've done a ton of videos about how to sell paper calls deals correctly. And most people that I see and that I talk to and that I start coaching are still selling deals ass backwards. Okay, so go look on the channel, go look on the blog on how to sell paper call deals correctly. Okay, and we do that by doing a pay per click ad spend test or a 30 day test. Look up those keywords and you'll find that training. Okay, this will ensure that like you have the least skin possible off of your back, so to speak, and you have the best price per call possible. And you know, without a shadow of a doubt, and you've proven it, that you can fulfill for the customer. Okay. So that's why we go direct to business, right? Versus pay per call. But when we look at these two criteria, when I go to a local dentist, right? And I tell the local dentist that I have, you know, calls coming in or I want to sell him pay per call. And I go directly after this number. And I tell him that the call is billable based upon a duration immediately we're having an adversarial conversation immediately like we're butting heads we're smacking head on into each other and the only thing that he can think of is well that's not fair if i don't have a chance to convert the customer why should i pay for it and folks i've dealt with this so many times right even with big professional companies right they don't know what percentage of calls that they're answering and that all that they can think about is that you're screwing them with this duration. Does that make sense to everybody joining us live on the call right now? So I'm gonna tell you guys how to get around this and I'm gonna teach you guys how I get even more favorable terms and what I mean by that is I end up getting more calls that are qualified when I go to direct local businesses because I'm able to pitch terms that actually end up penciling out to me and making me more qualified calls. And then obviously I'm also charging five, six, 10, even 15 times the amount per call. Does that sound like it's worth your time watching the rest of this video right now? I'm asking you, you guys are live. I need some feedback. I mean, for those of you guys watching the, 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 the video on YouTube or on the blog, you can still type in a comment. That'd be great so I can see it. Pat on the back. Hell yeah. All right. So this is what we do. We cut. We, we change up the order of these. So the first thing that we say is that they are in market. And we define in market as like they're looking for your type of business, okay? So they, if, if you're a dentist, they're looking for a dentist, okay? This does not mean that they are in market looking for one of the only three services that you offer, right? If they're highly specialized, we're gonna tell them from the get-go, we can't filter down our calls like that, right? We don't serve a percentage of a percentage of a percentage of the market, right? So if you wanna play with us, you can't just cherry pick calls. You gotta take all the calls, right? So that's a big lesson in and of itself, but in market for us simply means that they're looking for your type of business, okay? Then next is that they're in territory. Okay, not again to be to be clear here, it's not that they're in your service area. I, you know, if I sell paper call in West Palm Beach here, right, right down the street from me, throwing distance, if I sell paper call in West Palm Beach, I'm not gonna rely on one vendor or one local business to be able to handle my call volume. I want to sell to multiple people so that I diversify, right? I spread out my risk. Okay, so I can't deal with you know, Bob's Dental, right? Uh, servicing five miles from this address. And then I can't deal with ABC Smiles dealing with a radius of 20 miles around their address. Like those practicalities, they don't work. Does that make sense? Joe says, yes. 
Like it just doesn't happen. Like I'd have to filter out the calls at the beginning and I'd lose 20% of my revenue immediately. Like, no, I'm not doing that. Okay, so in territory for us means county. Okay, county based. Okay, they're county based. So in West Palm Beach, it's that the, the, the person is in Palm Beach County. Okay, for some businesses, just to be frank, guys, this is a little bit of a stretch. Palm Beach County is big, right? It's long. There's lots of little cities and areas and towns in Palm Beach County. For a dentist that people have to drive to, I got to be frank, like, I got to be honest, like, this can be a bit of a more of a tough sell. But that doesn't mean that we adjust our offer for them. Okay. So, um, Douglas Blatt says, how do you know what county? By listening to the phone call. Right? By listening to the phone call. They're going to give them their address as part of their onboarding, right? For 99% of the time. Right? If you're going to get an objection, oh, that's too far away. Right? Or you're going to get the address and it's not going to be the right county. Right? We're going to learn that if the company can't service that person on the phone call. Okay? So in market, in territory. Okay? Then... And notice I put this last. The call has to be over 30 seconds in duration. Notice I don't bring this up at the beginning. Instead, I say they're in market. They're looking for your type of business, right? They're in territory. And then I use this as like a plus. Plus, the call has to be over 30 seconds in duration because you couldn't book an appointment in 30 seconds, right? No. So I turn this, I spin this into a positive. Okay, so there's a there's an if here, okay, um, or there's an exception here, unless the call goes to voicemail, okay. So, <laughs> folks, at the end of the day, when running paper call, you know off the top of the bat that. Depending on the industry, um, the, these numbers are going to change. But let's say, like the home services, uh, home service industry, you know that there's going to be a 20 to 30 percent missed call ratio, right? Where the call goes to voicemail. It's not because the customer hung up, and you can look if you got a good call tracking platform on who hung up the call, right? It went to voicemail, and then they hung up, right? Um, or it rang and rang and rang for 10 minutes, right? And nobody answered. If that happens, understand that like that's not your problem. Like you can only control what you can obviously control. Like we can't control that. Okay. So if a call goes to voicemail, we still charge for that. Okay. Whether the caller leaves a voicemail or not, that's how we run it. And folks, the reason, the reason that we have this criteria in is because this has bitten us in the ass, bitten me in the ass one too many times. I've had people quite literally in one day miss 10 or 15 phone calls, right? And then you look at, or you think about how much you're charging them, whether it's 90 bucks, hundred bucks, or whether it's like big ticket lead gen and it's 400 bucks a call. That's a lot of money to anybody, right? That's not my risk, right? And um, the, the business owner, no matter what, if they made a commitment to pay somebody for advertising, this is going to happen no matter what, right? They're going to pay for a call if it goes to voicemail, no matter what advertising they're doing, correct? Correct. Okay. So when we look at what makes a call billable, um, this is how we do billing when we sell direct to local businesses. And when we run paper call, folks, um, I don't want this. I don't want to sell to paper call networks. The only time I ever sell to paper call networks is when I don't have an existing direct to local business customer. I use these only when absolutely necessary because I make a whole lot more money and that should be obvious in this scenario when I sell direct to local businesses. So how do we, how, how do we check each call for the billing criteria, right? 
So we have somebody actually go through and manually listen to these calls. Okay. And uh, in, in like home services, for example, you know, phone call duration is like probably an average of three minutes. Okay. So let's say that we send over 10 calls that are three minutes. Like that's an easy job for the week or for the month for a VA or somebody on our team to audit. Okay. It's not really that big of a deal. But if you take it one step further and you actually start doing this, you start to come up with filters that you can use, right? Like you come up with the call was missed and your call tracking platform uses that. You just bill them for a missed call, right? Like um, the, the call is, um, you know, over the billing criteria, right? It's over 30 seconds. Those are the ones that we need to listen to then that aren't missed. Okay, great. Then like folks, we don't have to listen to all three minutes. Like we can seek through the call, right? We can say, okay, let's listen 30 seconds in, then what happened? All right, great. Now let's fast forward or let's move to 60 seconds in, 90 seconds in. Okay, great. Yep. They're in territory. They booked a phone call. They definitely want their service done, right? That's billable. Okay, so it doesn't really mean that somebody's listening to the entire phone call is the takeaway that I want you to have. Okay, and again, right, by, by selling with this criteria versus paper call networks, I'm actually able to get a lot higher conversion rate from raw call actually into a qualified call for direct to local businesses versus paper call networks. And then obviously, like that's one multiple and one lever, right? The second lever is actually, right, the difference of what we're able to charge when we go direct versus what the paper call networks charge. Hope that makes sense. Next up is how do you pay your paper call auditors? And really the question was more like, how do you pay the people that listen to your phone calls to see if they're qualified or not qualified or billable or not billable? Okay, we call them, I call them, I train people to call them auditors, right? Their job is to audit a call for intent. Was the call billable, okay? And so, the question was like, do you pay them per call? Do you pay them per minute? Like, what do you do? And so the way that I have always done this is we pay per hour for this. And this is something where like, at the end of the day, <laughs> this job of, of, uh, of a pay per call auditor, this job is uber important. Like this is, this is our money, right? Like this is like one, Marking one job or one call, I'm sorry, as qualified versus not, could pay for that person for the day, for the week, for the month, or even more. Does that make sense to everybody? Like the difference of one call being qualified or not. So we pay these people per hour. And to be frank, like we don't just like outsource this for the cheapest price that we can. It's an important role in our company, okay? And so we pay actually pretty well for this job, okay? Then uh, we, we pay per hour, we pay well, but then the way that we really do this and what we found is effective um, is we like to, and again, you know, this is with me running a paper call business and this is the business that I grew from zero to $83,000 a month and recurring in four months. Like it was very important for us to process the calls as fast as possible because the faster we process them, the faster we get paid. And when you run a business that big and you're scaling as fast as I was, you need that money now. You don't want that money in 30, 60, 90 days, right? Like you want every dollar that you are owed and that you can collect immediately. So you, like how often do you audit is up to you, okay? For us, we were auditing every day, okay? And so we had a morning shift and we had an evening shift. And so people would come on and they would listen to phone calls and they would audit them, okay? Based upon the criteria, right, that I gave you guys here in this last video or this last question, right? They're in market, they're in territory, um, and it's 30 seconds in duration, okay? And so we paid them per hour, and then basically morning shift and an evening shift. Okay, as soon as the as soon as we caught up and we audited all the calls, they were done for the shift. Right? So if the evening shift comes on to work and it was a slow day and they only have 100 calls to audit, 
they only have 100 calls to audit, right? When they're done, even if it was like an hour into their shift, they can leave, right? We pay them per hour, okay? Then the morning crew comes in and does the morning shift, okay? Or they come back in the morning and complete their shift. And so we'd have people that would sign up for one shift a day or some people that would even sign up for two shifts a day, okay? But I think at the end of the day, like how often do you do your auditing really comes down to how many billable calls are you doing per day? And, and then thinking about thinking about as well, like how much money or how much liability is that? If you only process calls once a week, what's your potential liability? Oh, well, we got this site and it brings in this many calls. This is what we're seeing for qualified. This is the, the price we pay, right? So then it's like, it's a simple math equation. Like how far are you willing to give your customers credit for, so to speak, before you catch back up with billing? And so for me, guys, like I'm, I'm keeping my customers fair to me every single day, right? Like I, I'm not gonna trust them for 90 days, especially when I got a boatload of them. There's no freaking way. If they stop performing and they don't pay, right? I'm turning off the calls to them and I'm sending them to somebody else instead, okay? And I'm downplaying as, as far as possible the liability that I have because I'm spending a lot of money on, on traffic and, and resources to build the company. Does that make sense to everybody? Give me a six if that makes sense for everybody joining me here live. So the other tip that I can give you um, is um, if you're using like traditional call tracking to, uh, to, to mark whether or not they're billable, um, Everybody's got like phone codes or some people call them like tags and, and where you can mark whether or not it was a good call or you can put in different criteria. So that's how I would keep track of calls and how they were billable or not is just with some type of tagging mechanism, right? Um, but then also if I were you, most call tracking platforms again, will let you actually comment on a phone call. Okay, so then I would, if I were you, um, I would put in I would put in uh, inside the comment, I would have whoever audited the call put in their name, right? So now I got a paper trail, okay? Now I got a paper trail. So one of the things that we did is like, we, we let our advertisers um, and we would have our resellers in our paper call agency, we would have them be able to um, dispute a call. Right. So if they thought it wasn't qualified, right, they'd tell us that they didn't and they'd tell us why. So whoever the auditor was, right, that tagged the phone call as qualified, and then um, you know, the, the call got pushed back or clawed back because the person said it wasn't qualified, and here's the reason why, they would have to review that call. Right. And and give the final decision on whether it was qualified or not. So this is like how we kept the auditors. Now I would suggest that you guys keep the auditors like true and honest to their job, so to speak. This is how you hold them accountable. All right, so next up, uh, the, the question that we got was, hey Joe, I am in the market, and I'm sorry, I forget the name for this. I'm, I'm in the, um, I know that one of them was tree service market, and I'm also in another market, and I'm doing rank and rent right now, should I move to pay per call, okay? Should I move to pay per call? Would it be more lucrative for me to move to pay per call? And so I wanna walk you guys through this and, and you know, if you were going to make the change, how it would work. But at the end of the day, the pushback on, on rank and rent, and, and guys, I, I have spent a, a good amount of time trying to make rank and rent work. So this doesn't come with no experience, right? And we only talk about, you know, things things that I've experienced. Excuse me. Um, the, the big downfall with rank and rent is like the pushback that I always got and the objection that I always got was like, show me the results, right? So like from a prospect's perspective, it's like, great, you're ranking, so you must be getting a bazillion freaking phone calls. And so, yeah, I can ROI that no problem, but like how many calls are you getting or can you guarantee the number of calls? So if you're doing rank and rent, you are 
you're trying to hide this. You're trying to downplay the number of phone calls that you're getting. Right. You, the, the reason in my mind that you offer rank and rent versus paper call is because you don't have the goods to back it up. Right. The site may be ranking for some long tail keywords, but it's not getting any phone calls. Right. So then you go try to sell it with a rank and rent model. And so then every customer that you have is like they're giving you the objection, like where are the phone calls. Right. Like show me the proof and you have no proof. So, you know, every once in a while you're able to get somebody to, to buy on rank and rent. Right. But then a month in, they're like, dude, I didn't get one phone call. No, thanks. Right. And they cancel. And so as fast as somebody came in and bought your rank and rent model, they jumped out because there was no demonstrable ROI. Does that make sense? See, for me, because of that, rank and rent doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It doesn't make a whole lot of dollars and cents, right? It just doesn't play out for me, okay? Selling somebody on ranking in Google and the, like them renting the website or page from you um, doesn't really work because like they can't even see themselves in the product because it's not their website, right? It's not their phone number. It's like it, it's, the model's just messed up. So for me, if if you're being successful with rank and rent. So if you are successful with rank and rent, you're losing a ton of money. Okay, and you're losing a ton of money because you're not getting compensated on a paper call basis. Okay, so we have days, right? Running paper call or quite literally I would make what probably most people make in a rank and rent scenario, I would make that in a day, right? Like in, in pay per call, you have like windfall days, right? You have days where a storm just happened and so everybody's calling your contractor, right? You have days where in, in the middle of nowhere, your campaign is billing, you know, let's say 10 unique calls a month and then this month comes and you do 40 you do 50, you do 100. That doesn't happen, right, in rank and rent. You're just getting that flat fee every month, okay? And so what happens in paper call is because you're incentivized by getting paid per call, you obviously are gonna put more time, effort, and money into the thing. And as your call volume grows, so does your income, and so does your bank account, so does your paycheck, so to speak. And I wanna ask you guys a question, like when it comes to local SEO, when it comes to local marketing, when it comes to every traffic source that you would run, any traffic source that you would run for a local business and for a pay per call offer, is all the work front loaded, yes or no? Is like 90% of the work front loaded? Yes, it's all extremely laborious in the setup process, right? So like, you could be ranking number 20 in Google and number you know, three in Google, and the only thing that's happened is just time has passed. Does that make sense? Right, you just haven't reaped the rewards of your work yet. The site hasn't just kind of aged yet enough. So why on God's green earth would you wanna get paid a flat rate, right, instead of getting paid per call and when that thing hits the first page of google your income 10x's like to me rank and rent to be honest is the most backwards fucking local or seo or affiliate model ever like it's just plain ignorant and i would love to be proven wrong right like I've had people come to me and they're like, yeah, I'm crushing it with paper call or I'm crushing it with rank and rent. Joe, why should I move to paper call? And I'm able to show them like very quickly, right? Like here, look at this, look at this, look at this, right? You just tripled your income. You're welcome. Like where's my, where's my daily rate?
at the end of the day, again, this model is very front loaded. So you do all the work to get the rankings, right? And to rank on page one, right? But then you're not getting the long-term benefits of getting paid for the results that you generated. That to me isn't a, a, a win-win scenario, right? So the next question we got is, how do you compete with Google LSA, local service ads, when doing pay per call? Okay, so for those of you guys that aren't familiar with Google local service ads, do a little search inside of Google on what they're for, and you'll find us ranking um, uh, at Digital Triggers on the first page. And I've done like a, a big step-by-step -step layout of it, a case study of it, uh, comparing the costs uh, versus AdWords and everything else. Uh, and, uh, and we keep this thing updated because it's something that uh, I'm really paying attention to. And the person who asked this question, sorry, I can't do you justice and shout you out live. I don't have your name here. I guess I got to start putting it on this title slide. Um, the person that asked this question is like, their mind's going down the right path, right? At the end of the day, Google LSA, um, at least right now, is, is cheaper than pay-per-click. Okay, in, in most markets, or at least as it stands right now, it's hard for me to make like this blanket statement, all right? Um, and, and LSA are the ads at the top of Google uh, for just some niches that say like Google guaranteed and they have that little badge and then you can like see info about the business and fill out a form request or make a phone call. That's Google LSA. And Google, Google is now charging per lead. Right, so this is Google's model, right? Pay per lead with LSA. So again, the question is, how do you compete with Google LSA when doing pay per call? So for me, guys, like I don't compete. Like why on God's green earth would you compete with LSA if it's cheaper than pay per click ads? Like, why would you try to have an apples to apples comparison comparing your service to LSA? Like, you shouldn't. Like, obviously, like, that's a retarded thing to do, right? Look, Mr. Prospect, I want to charge you a whole lot more than Google is charging you. Buy my leads instead of Google's. Like, who the hell are you, bro? So I would never try to compete with Google LSA, okay? So first and foremost, you guys got the ketchup and mustard. I, I brought you up to speed, right? LSA is cheaper than pay-per-click in terms of cost per lead, right? Google now with LSA is charging per lead. Like don't compete on price, okay? So what is the way, right, that we can leverage Google LSA? How can we make this a win for everybody in pay-per-lead and pay-per-call? What do we do? right? How do we turn the market on its head, right? And I'm sure that some of you guys have already figured out the answer in your head. You have a good angle and you guys are the ones that are killing in the marketplace because you're thinking on your feet. How do we use this as a sales angle and a sales enabler instead of thinking about how we compete? So for me, this is a sales angle. There's a lot of people when you hit them up on a local level and you're trying to sell them paper call, local businesses, right? And it doesn't matter what niche, but a lot of niches out there, they have no idea what the hell paper call even is, right? So you're trying to sell them something that now you got to explain. And it's easy to get to the end result explaining, right? But I'm letting LSA be one of my filters, right? If people are already paying per call or paying per lead, I'm not going to try to compete with Google LSA in terms of price, right? And in terms of quality and everything else. No, it's just like, hey, Mr. Prospect, if you need more than Google LSA is providing, let me know. I can help you. Like my best customers in pay per call aren't ones that only spent money with me and the only thing that they did was pay per call. Quite the opposite. My best pay per call customers are the ones that are growing at a rapid pace. They understand their numbers and they're willing to pay me max dollar to get them more because they are having a scaling problem. 
they're doing Google ads, they're doing Google LSA, right? They're ranking organically, they're in the three pack, right? They're hitting everything that they possibly freaking can and they still want more. Like folks, those, those are your whales. Those are your big customers. And not only are they whales, but they're like stress-free whales because they've already figured it. All the client education is gone. You get to skip that shit. Does that make sense to everybody? Everybody joining me live on the call, give me a one. Like don't freaking compete. Go after the people doing Google LSA and be like, Dude, congratulations, great freaking job. How's it going, right? Can I help you get more? Let Google LSA do the filtering. Good stuff, All right? So next up, the question that we got was like, Joe, what's, what's the best agency cold outreach strategy? Right, give it to me, you know, give it to me blank. Give, me to, give it to me, you know, w without the BS, right? Tell me what it is. And for me, guys, at the end of the day, um, really where this question was headed is like, what's the model that's best? Is it, is, it, um, is it like LinkedIn? Is it Facebook? Is it cold email? Like what's, what's the method, so to speak? What's the medium, I guess, is, is really the better question. And folks, what I would suggest, like th this person is trying to hit uh, a grand slam right out of the gate and not have to go through a learning curve. Understand that that's like, that's not gonna happen. Like you're gonna have to iterate, right? You're gonna have to um, play with your messaging, okay? And the medium in terms of where you're doing it, again, whether it's cold email, whether it's Facebook, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's something completely different, right? If I were you, I wouldn't focus on the medium. Okay, instead, I would focus on the messaging. Okay, I would focus on the messaging. Okay, once we get the messaging down, we have a market that has a problem, we know how to solve the problem, right? And, and we know how to demonstrate that via messaging to a customer or to a prospect and close them. Medium is gonna work as long as the, the person's there. As long as that person is active, right? The person that you're trying to sell, whether it's a marketing director or whether it's the business owner, right? As long as that person resides in email, whether that person resides in LinkedIn, whether that person actually goes on Facebook, right? Is really the only question at that stage, right? Like, can I get their attention on this platform? Does that make sense? Like if you try to go prospect on LinkedIn and I tell you LinkedIn and you don't nail your messaging, right? You 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 just start with the medium instead. You could go after a niche, right? That quite literally isn't on LinkedIn and you're just wasting your damn time. Like instead, let's focus on the messaging. Okay, because if you nail your messaging, like this is the key to scale, right? Like the the key to scale is having an offer that really, really works and that you know uh, what to say, how to say it, you can speak the language, you can speak that person's like niches language, right? Is it an appointment? Is it a doctor? Is it a patient? Like, what do they call things? What are people, what are prospects worth to them? How long is their lead time? Like, you gotta get down that, that, that lingo so you can have an educated conversation with a prospect without being green without being a newbie cannon, right? So if I were you, I wouldn't focus again on the medium in terms of where am I doing it? Instead, I would focus on the messaging, okay? So I would, don't focus on the medium, okay? Instead, focus on the messaging. Next, I would pick one niche so that you can get really, really, really hyper-focused on the messaging, right? Because how do you prove your messaging if you're changing up the niche from time to time to time, that would mean like the offer is going to change. The words are going to change. You're going to have to be thinking on your feet about, is this a dentist? Is this a home services client? Is this a roofing client? Like what's the average customer? What's this? What's that? Like instead of just being able to listen to the freaking prospect. Okay. So next I think definitely pick one niche, right? Um, and, and then like folks, this is it. This is like, this is all that you have to do 
right in the next 30 days and you could build in the next 30 days you could build your your mvp your minimum viable product and you could collect six figures in annual contracts no problem just focusing on this and throwing the rest of the shit out the fucking window like don't build a website don't do this don't do that don't do everything else like this is the mvp if you do nothing else in the next month do this this is what's going to get you the furthest okay there's one final step that i would use when you start reaching out to prospects cold okay and if you have like a warm traffic source like you know 10 dentists and that's the niche the niche that you want to go after like we'll hit all 10 of them up right and focus on them first right and just focus on the messaging and win that before you go on further right but once you exhaust those warm resources and you gotta go cold right like when you're leading uh or when you're prospecting hold it, the the last kind of fourth trick the last kind of uh big thing is is to lead with value right like make them an offer that they can't refuse and i'm not saying like pitch them in an email on your first acquaintance like that's too much like you're trying to take you know your your first date to bed when you just you know met them at the bar and you didn't even buy them a drink right like it just doesn't that's not how things work so make them an offer right find something find your perfect prospect and then find something that's wrong right find an issue find an opportunity and offer to solve it for free like hey abc dentist you know dr mike i saw that there's a big problem with your website your web form isn't working like quite literally i want to fill it out right to request to be a patient and it's not working can we jump on a quick 15 minute call and i'll fix it right like who's going to tell you no right then while you're fixing it you get the idea or you get the opportunity to start focusing on your messaging and start asking questions hey dr mike like what are the problems that you're having in your business right now right like what's what marketing's working like and just use that as an opportunity to pick their brain even if you don't have an offer yet don't worry about that just get on the phone and, and freaking learn like be a sponge right and if you don't have an offer to go right away, that's fine. Just be like, all right, Dr. Mike, is, is there anything that I could help you with right now after you get done solving the first problem? Are there any other issues you could think of that maybe I could help you with? Like, just ask for the business. Use it as a chance to get closer and to learn the niche, okay? Become a student, right? Become a student. So this is the four-step strategy, if I were you, to, to really work on developing um, an offer and to develop the, the messaging for that offer and to tie that to a niche, okay? And, and then ultimately, when, when you start prospecting, you're gonna have to go out cold and you're not gonna be an expert in the niche yet. And when you do that, I think personally, the best way when you're in that scenario and, and you're prospecting cold is to lead with value. All right, all right. So the next question is from Dave uh, Manaville or Manville. And Dave says, my call only campaign is reporting a different number of clicks than I'm seeing in my call tracking platform. What's the best way to dispute this with Google or address the concern with my clients? And folks, at the end of the day, your clicks and your reporting in Google ads in terms of clicks on call only ads and call tracking, those two data sources are never going to show the same number. Quite literally, we'll, we'll never show the same number, right? And the reason that they won't show the same number is Google charges you Uh, and the reason is, is that Google charges you per click, right? Your call tracking shows calls, right? So even on call only, when somebody hits on mobile, they do a search for dentist in Miami or cosmetic dentist, and, and then your ad comes up. 
for your client, right? And, and it's got a little phone icon and they click on it. That doesn't just start calling immediately. Like it doesn't start ringing. It shows a pop-up on the phone, right? That asks if the caller then wants to call the number. And it's either like call or end, right? So you gotta understand, and we've done the math and I've broken this down for you guys live on the channel. Like it can take, okay, two to three calls, for example, to equal a phone call or two to three clicks, sorry, two to three clicks to equal, whoop, to equal one phone call. Okay, and, and guys, when I'm doing planning, when I'm working with a prospect, like um, I, I don't tell them that Google Ads is gonna win every time, right? Because it doesn't always win, right? Like Google is not a slot machine. It doesn't work every single time. Best practices over time, will most of them work? Yes, right? But I will never want to set an expectation that I can't live up to. I would all day, every day, hands down, rather under promise and over deliver. And that is the goal with every single prospect and customer. Okay, so when I'm talking to a customer about this and I'm selling them on running some Google ads uh, or Google call only ads, right? I'll break down the math with them. I will tell them flat out, not every person that tries call only ads is going to beat their cost per acquisition, right? This isn't a magic bullet. It doesn't work around the clock. Like, and Google's not like that. Okay, but here's the thing, okay, here's the thing. And then I show them the math, okay? So let's break down the math here. So if, if their website is good, it's probably converting customers at one in 10, okay? If with call only, Right, it takes, even on the worst case, it takes three clicks to get a phone call, meaning one in three, right? What's the difference in conversion rate? Right, like this is, this is 10% and this is 33%. And again, folks, I wanna downplay the results. Like, look at this amazing case study. It was freaking awesome. Look at the CPA difference. Like, my customer doing call only, this is what they achieved, but it doesn't always work. Let's bring them back into reality. And then let's take them through worst case scenario. Like, let's say that even like this, in, instead of 33%, um, let's say that this is, you know, that this is only, you know, let's say that this is one in five even, right? And that this is 20% conversion, right? Like Mr. Business Owner, by not testing Google call only ads, you're potentially missing out tw two times as many leads For hypothetically, the same cost. Now, are, are desktop clicks and mobile clicks the same? No, right? But give me give me a four in the chat if you guys are here live. If you understand how this breaks down, like I would show them a case study if I was talking with a prospect. Here's a crazy win. You're not doing this right now, right? Here's a crazy win. CPA before call only ads right, CPA after, okay, now, right, now, I'd like to do this for you, but let's say worst case scenario, and we paint this picture, right, like what business owner is going to tell you no, nobody's going to tell you no, right, right, Mr. Business Owner, by not testing Google call only ads, you're potentially missing out, out, on two times as many leads for hypothetically the same cost. Would it make sense to dot, 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 right? Insert pitch.
right? Wouldn't it make sense to work with a pay-per-click management company that is consistently looking at best practices and rolling out tests for their all of their customers to ensure that they are getting the best results possible with Google pay-per-click? Yes, okay, great. So wouldn't it make sense for you to give us a shot to do this for you and to take over from your existing agency? Yes. Right, so that would be an example of how you could transition into a pitch to go sell call only ads yourself. Okay, you could from here then sell a 30 day test. Like your options are limitless. Understand though, I gave you guys the freaking perfect setup here. Right, how you want to take it next and what you want to sell into, right, is really up to you. You can use the example that I gave you here. You could do the uh, the 30 day test that we talk about a lot on the channel, but your options, frankly, are limitless. You are the king of spin, Scott Lindsay says. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. The king of spin. I like that. I'll have to quote you. I need a good pick, though. All right, guys. So that is it. That is the last question from yet another AMA. And today was a little longer session, about 30 minutes longer. I appreciate you guys sticking around until the end. Um, at the very beginning of the webinar, somebody, though, asked uh, a question. Um, so the place to put those is digitaltriggers.io slash AMA. That's also the place that you register for these calls. If you're watching this uh, this replay or this video uh, on uh, on YouTube or on the blog uh, after we've done it here live, each and every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, we run an Ask Me Anything webinar. You can register for it at digitaltriggers.io slash AMA. And again, that stands for Ask Me Anything. And then on the thank you page, you'll have a link to actually go and actually ask me your, uh, your very own question. And I definitely recommend like saving that URL, like write it down, save it as a bookmark and uh, and keep asking me questions, right? Like I can only do these AMAs if I have you guys attending and if I have you guys engaged in asking me questions or ultimately I'm gonna run out of things to, to talk about. And, uh, and thankfully you guys have done a killer job in today's AMA session was absolutely fantastic because of your great question. So thank you guys so, so freaking much. If you guys need anything, uh, just let us know in the chat here real quick uh, and we'll be shutting this thing down here in just a second. Everybody have a fantastic, fantastic rest of the week. And you guys know where to find me, right? See you guys next Wednesday on the AMA. Sayonara, everybody.